What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the 585 Report. Uh, Mitch Broder here alongside my co-host, Ryan Sullivan. And the Bills come off an impressive win over the Washington football team, uh, winning 43-21 in a game that uh, was kind of a blow at the beginning, had a little drama uh, in the middle, and then the Bills really did pull away. And uh, we're going to get into that also with some... Uh, Bill's Texans preview uh, towards the end here of this episode, but uh, a lot to talk about. And uh, Ryan, this this was, I think, for most Bill's fans looking at this game, uh, a real sigh of relief, I think, because the story of this game is Josh Allen playing at that 2020 MVP level that everyone was sort of waiting for and concerned that, you know, maybe that was sort of just the high end Josh Allen. Well, we did see it here in week three. Yeah, Josh did everything that we saw him do last year and more. Off-platform throws, throws from the pocket, throws in the tight windows. If if you were someone who was concerned, I know we kind of blew it off last week, but there was people out there who was concerned, hey, is he figured out? Hey, uh, you know, it was last year a mirage. It, you know, I, it would be a little unfair for me to sit here and say, oh, look, he's going to play this level all year. But we th- that Josh is there and when you give him the the time and the and the throws he's he's gonna make him he's gonna make him pay and it, it was just a really fun almost stress-free game to watch on Sunday yeah I mean and and I think what what my biggest takeaway with Josh like why why did Josh play better than what we had seen the last two weeks I I, I personally believe that with the expectations this team had with the expectation that Josh Allen has with the contract he signed. There was a lot of pressure on him. And I really think that he was overthinking in those first two games. He was really in his head. He just didn't seem to really just be like playing freely. And that for me, I think was the biggest thing I saw in week three for Josh was that he just was out there making plays. He wasn't so much thinking. He was just letting his instincts take over. And, um, you know, he was loose with it, which, and I mean, that in a good way, you know, he wasn't pressing. He was just taking what the defense gave him. He was, you know, making plays outside the pocket. And it was just, like you said, it, it was exactly kind of what we had seen last year. And, you know, is it unreasonable to expect this kind of a performance outside of, from Josh every single week? And I, I, I think to an extent, yes. But for me, I was just very encouraged to see that because I said it. I said, once Josh Allen has one of these games, right? Once he has one of these epic, you know, performances, you know, the over 300 yards, the multiple touchdowns, you know, I think that you're going to see him get that confidence and his swagger back and get back to the level that we believe he's at. Because, you know, regardless if you think this is the level Josh Allen can play at week in, week out, I think it's safe to say the last two weeks were a little, you know, we're subpar for him. We're, we're below what, what he expects out of himself. So I, 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 I mean, I guess answering the question, right, of like, is the offense fine? Like after this week, Ryan, I don't know about you, my concern level for the offense is completely zero, and I, I'm confident that they are totally back on track and right where they should be moving forward. Well, and, and here's what's even more, I think, uplifting and so much more uh, puts you at ease with this game is that, you know, I it's not that everything went right on offense. This offensive line still struggled in parts of this game. Deron Payne had his way with Cody Ford and – I was up at about a 27% pass rush win rate for the game and one of the highest PFF grades for a pet for, for of anyone uh, this week. So there were issues on the offense still, but Josh just looked so much more comfortable. He, his maneuverability in the pocket, there were times, you know, you go back to that first drive and I, and I tweeted out right as that drive was happening, they were getting beat that right side of the line with Cody Ford was getting beat or excuse me, the left, whatever side Cody Ford plays on, it takes me now, but it was, yeah, it was right. Cause Darrell Williams on the same side was getting beat. Deron Payne was in the backfield multiple times. And Josh just kind of did his little shimmy, did his little step up and found his guys. So, you know, issues that existed in that first game with, with the line getting beat, Josh, you know, whether well, he went back and watched tape, whether he went back and did new drills, whatever it is, he, he was able to sort his way through the traffic and make plays that you know that fell apart and you know it, what makes josh and you know this is really fun to talk about what makes josh that's a such a cheat code 
is is those plays though. I mean, go to that first Emmanuel Sanders touchdown. I got him out of pocket. He's going to the sideline, and that back end that back end uh, shot of that throw is ridiculous. It that was a tiny window, and he put where only Emmanuel Sanders could get it. You know, the accuracy, the pinpoint accuracy was just there all day. The Dawson Knox touchdown. I mean, you talk about low percentage throws, back shoulder from where he was on the field to Dawson Knox against the boundary is just next level, high level throwing. And it, it was just everything you need to see from him to just, you know, to feel good about the rest of the season. And, and, you know, now going into the rest of the year, the P uh, Aaron chats came out with that PFF came out with their own ranking. Bills have one of the easiest schedules from this point forward. So it's if he can make it through this stretch and, you know, there's a couple more hard games in there, he can get out a run here and he can get hot. Yeah, two things. One, I love that you brought up that schedule because, yeah, I'm, that, that's what's crazy is that the Bills, a lot of people are sitting here saying, you know, they got one of the easiest, if not the easiest remaining schedule here, and they still have to play Kansas City, which I think goes to show the rest of the schedule is just, I don't want to say a cakewalk, but it definitely – I think allows the bills to really build so much confidence and, and especially heading into the end of the season. Cause that's when you want to be playing your best football, you know, November and December. And that's where, you know, the bill schedule arguably gets the easiest. So no, that's definitely something I think bills fans should be excited about and come to, th- especially too, when you look at it, I mean, you know, I understand that the, the last three teams, the bills played, you know, with Washington, Pittsburgh and, and Miami, yes, they have their flaws and issues, but, uh, you know, you have two playoff teams and a 10 win team that they just played three weeks straight. That's not necessarily the easiest stretch to open up a season. You know, they didn't get a Houston until now. They didn't get a Jacksonville. They didn't, you know, they're not like the Broncos who every team the Broncos have played this season is winless right now. So there, there was bound to be maybe a little rockiness to start the year, but they, they seem to have found their stride. And another person who I think has finally got to hit the rhythm similar to Josh is Brian Dable. I think Brian Dable called a great game against Washington. And and more importantly, I think that the, the piece of this offense that was missing, I think, as far as emphasizing was getting the ball to Colt Beasley. And I think that that allows Allen to get in the rhythm, to be confident when he's hitting Beasley and getting those, you know, second and twos, second and threes, you know, which are such high percentage conversion rates on those downs and distance. So I, I think that Brian Dable did a much better job getting the offense ahead of the chains and allowing Allen to again just get in that rhythm because for him, once he once he makes a couple throws early in the game, right, gets a, a couple completions, he seems to kind of just go from there. And 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 that's where I think that Dable did a great job, just getting him into that rhythm, getting his confidence going early in the game. Because you could kind of tell after about four, five, six plays in this game, uh, it was going to be a good day for Josh Allen. Yeah, I was talking about with Kyle uh, on Twitter the other day that uh, the, the Kyle Knapp was Buffalo that. I feel like you always kind of know what kind of day Josh is going to have in his first couple throws. Like if his first couple throws are on the money, you know, it's going to be a buckle up type of game. And if he has comes out with a couple, just air balls, uh, sales, a couple passes, it always seems like it, it, it's no balls from there and goes downhill. And having Cole Beasley, you know, knowing what the, Washington's weakness was like we had Parker come in and talk about how Bostic is someone who was getting beat throughout the first two games. Uh, they talked on Napno Buffalo how he was giving up passes left and right and couldn't cover anyone, and and just knowing where to attack those weaknesses and and capitalize on them, and, and you know just not making things harder than they have to be and, and taking what the defense gives you, you know, that's super demoralizing when you're just giving up chunk plays of seven, eight, nine yards. And it, it showed Josh's average air yards per target went up the first two games. They were around five. His average air yards uh, are air yards per attempt, not air yards per target air yards per attempt was 10. That's the more having just taking what the defense gives you opens up that kind of stuff. And just, getting everyone involved in this game plan like we saw last year. Emmanuel Sanders, I mean, talk about a guy that, that's aging backwards, had a monster game, two big catches, three big catches, touchdown, that that go ball in, in the first half. Just like it's hard to really nitpick 
anything that went wrong on this offense. So I'll, I'll ask you the question, Mitch, is, was there anything that stuck out to you that was bad with this offense uh, on Sunday? I, I struggled to really write anything in my notes that was like bad. I mean, yeah, you saw Cody Ford get beat um, a decent amount by Deron Payne, but Deron Payne is also a really good interior defensive lineman. Uh, so he's a handful for anybody. So I, I didn't look at that panic so much. Um, I mean, Singletary really didn't do anything. I wrote that down. Uh, what else I write down here? I, you know, Gabe Davis has kind of been a little bit of an afterthought on the offense, but again, it didn't really hurt them. They still had 358 yards passing. Um, so honestly, I, maybe outside of the protection, I mean, nothing much. I mean, at the end of the day, Ryan, I was looking back on it and I mean, they only punted two times the entire game. They scored on every single drive except two drives that ended in a punt and one they kneeled it out with Trubisky at the end. That was it. Like, that's that that is as good as execution as you're gonna get from their offense, especially with the fact that not only did they throw for, you know, 358, they ran for what, 130? I mean, they had 500 yards of offense just about in this game against a top-notch defense. Like, I, I really don't have much to, you know, complain about, if you will, on this offense. You know, I, I I'll take my medicine today because before the game, I tweeted out that Cody, I was taking a victory lap for for manning the Cody Ford fan club as long as I had. I think Cody Ford had, out of this whole team, I think objectively had the worst day. And John Feliciano held his own in this game and and didn't get beat in any sort of catastrophic way. So I, even that, you know, you saw some improvement and hopefully Cody Ford can get together before the next game. And we still haven't talked about Zach Moss coming in and having yep. maybe one of his best games as a Bill. Just, uh, I've always, you know, I think if you've listened to this podcast enough, you've always known that I, I'm partial to Zach Moss over Devin Singletary because they are very similar backs in the way they want to win with just shiftiness, not speed. But when Zach Moss can get in the space and gets ahead of steam, that's not a dude you want to tackle. He is a he is one of the funnest dudes to watch get out there, and because once he gets out there and he gets to the second level, he puts his head down and just runs through dudes. That touchdown pass, that touchdown catch he had, which was just a, a he said an angle route that broke out in the scramble rules that he said in in the post game. Just to, that that was you watch the turn he made there. That was a move Cole Peasley makes on a regular that little pivot turn that he made for for a really nice catch and for a touchdown, you know, it, just impressive. And, you know, not to, to rave too much, but you know, the, we even talked about Dawson Knox yet, man, right. a guy that has rightfully caught so much flack on this team. And finally through three games is, has, I guess you could consider that fourth down pass that was behind him. They might count I don't know if they counted that as a drop or not, but, catching the ball hasn't had any bad drops yet Mm -hmm. has is catching touchdowns and is playing at you know we don't don't i think kyle put it out today that he's on pace for 600 yards if we get 600 yards out of dawson knox right that's that's like the the third best tight end season of a bill ever so there's just it it, you know i struggle not to buy too much into this game because you know Washington's defense is struggling but man it was just it, it was really fun and, and fans and the team really should enjoy this because I think it was just a, it, it was a, it was just a fun it was a fun offensive game right I mean a few things to unpack I mean starting with you know Dawson I mean the, I think the best thing for Dawson right now the best measuring stick is is great plays versus terrible drops because for Dawson Knox he's always made the one or two awesome plays that make you get all excited but then he has the couple drops that make you pull your hair out of your head and so far this season he's made a couple really awesome plays and like you said we haven't seen the horrific drop from Dawson you know where he's wide open and he just goes right through his hands he like that that throw was a little behind him so I don't know if you put that on him but I mean that catch he had in the end zone I mean what a ridiculous catch to get from a tight end, nonetheless, too. I mean, the fact that he, he had to turn around completely, got his foot down. I mean, that was like textbook. And and then, funny enough, and then with the running backs, too, like, I, I know this is a whole debate, and, and I feel like we've been having this debate for two years, right? RB1, who is it? I think I've come to the conclusion where RB1 is just whoever is 
feeling it. Whoever's got the hot hand, right? The first two weeks, it was clear Singletary was RB1. This game, it was Moss. Like, I, I don't put so much stock into who is RB1 on the depth chart because it's just like what we saw from New England, right? Because that's where Dable came from. Like, when New England had, has always had, like, four or five running backs, and every week it seems to be some different guy who is a big piece of the game plan and what they do. So I think you're kind of going to see that with with um, Singletary and with Moss. That it's just going to come down to a week-by-week matchup situation. Who who kind of gives them what they want? Because although they are similar running backs, they also do things a little differently than each other. Um, but Moss was great. I think this was his best game as a bill. I agree with you 100%. Even that catch he had, I think it was in the first half. Um, he showed some real like juice, like some quickness. Like he zoomed by a guy, made a nice cut. It was like, you know, where's that been for, for a year now? So, and then on top of all, which I think makes it so funny, like we've been mentioning, you know, Beasley, Sanders, not, we're not even talking about Stefan Diggs. And yet this offense still had 500 yards of offense. And Diggs was just kind of like, you know, a, he had his numbers. I mean, he had six for 60, but like, that's what I think also gets, I think she should get Bills fans so excited is that the offense put up these numbers and your best weapon didn't really do anything crazy. So no, I agree. That was, it, it was definitely really fun to watch. And, and, and it was great that also, you know, to just to see that again, because I think had it been three weeks in a row of this offense sort of teetering, um, not looking great. I think it, it would have started to cause for some concern, but you saw it and you know, that it is there and that they can play at that level that we saw from a year ago. And especially paired with this defense that, once again, three weeks in a row, like, took care of business. I mean, I I don't know how that doesn't get you so excited about what this team could reach because this defense, I know they haven't played the best offenses through through three weeks, but for playing bad offenses, this is how we, we should expect them to look, which is pretty much just suffocating and dominant. Yeah, I mean... I, I joked about a post game that, you know, every year it's like, man, if only we had uh, the, the Tyrod Taylor offense with the Jim Schwartz defense, right? Or if only we had the 2020 offense with the 2019 defense today, you got both of them in a big way. And I think what's even more impressive about this game is, yeah, it was 14. It was, it was 43, 21, but it wasn't, it, you have the broken play by Antonio mm-hmm. Gibson which, you know, it's on tape. Teams are going to go to that. They're going to have to find a way to stop that because you know that now that that's on tape, teams are going to try to do it again until they prove they can stop it. So that's something they got to figure out. But out, you have that. You have just that really weird kickoff that Isaiah McKenzie, you got to come up and grab that. But just a super glitchy football play that gives them a super short field and they score. And then besides that, they don't go out and get another touchdown until the Bills already have 43 points on the board. So just a, a a dominant, dominant, dominant performance. I I calculated it out when you take away the Antonio Gibson touchdown and you take away the the garbage time drive where they uh with the touchdown pass to Logan Thomas, they had 179 yards outside of those two plays, and they didn't get they weren't bringing pressure. They didn't blitz as much as they had blitz in their other games, and the front four they they weren't bad. They they were they were clip. You saw you saw him collapse the pocket a little bit. Yeah, well, wasn't getting sacks, wasn't getting pressured the same way because it's a good offensive line that they went up against. But the secondary just held it down. There was nothing there. They forced Heineke to to make some bad throws, and you know it shows that they're not this one dimensional team. You know, I think sometimes you look at a team like like that's how Washington wants to play. Washington's a team that wants to play with, you know, hopefully we can run rush four and then our, our back end can hold up. But they didn't have the secondary talent to do that. Buffalo rush four and they had the secondary talent to, to hold up playing uh, what it probably when it's all said and done is going to be a mediocre quarterback helps, but just different ways you can win. I think the guy who keeps, who keeps flashing and everyone's talking about Matt Milano was like quietly mm-hmm. having, not even quietly at this point. Cause he's, he's starting to get national praise. Greg Rosenthal, Mina Kimes. I've been starting to call him out is having like, an all pro borderline defensive player of the year type season just in the backfield. I mean, the high Nicky plays the one you remember, but pass breakups hitting dudes. Like he's just always at the right place. And he looks every penny worth that four year contract we gave him and, and just immense, immense value for the level that he's playing at right now. 
I mean, I I don't think I could say enough really about this defense from this game. I mean, start to start with the you know for starters. I love the game plan that Leslie Frazier had for this game because we had seen for two weeks the Bills be really aggressive on defense and send lots of pressure and blitz and exotic looks. And they said, listen, we're playing Taylor Heineke, which one of Heineke's best attributes is his ability to escape from the pocket. So they just said, we're going to rush for, keep him in the pocket and wait till he inevitably makes a mistake because you know a lot of people were comparing him to like Fitzpatrick. And I think what you saw was kind of that, like, Eventually, he kind of felt the pressure to have to put up some points because they were down 21 nothing quickly, and he made some really ill-advised throws in that game. And Like so Ryan I, Fitzpatrick. I just, exactly, right. Like, exa- right, just, just like Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like, he, you know, he... So, I, I think that that was a great call by Leslie Frazier because I think for a guy like him, you know, just let your players go out there and make plays when they're going against an, an inferior quarterback, which the Bills were. And then also kind of going with the game plan. I've, I've said this for... Um, ever since McDermott took over, and and this hasn't been the case for every single game, but g- generally speaking, the th- the Bills have always been so good on defense on not letting the offense beat you with what they do best. And one of the two things that the Washington offense does best is run the football and it's get the ball to, to Terry McLaurin. And this game, they didn't really do either. They rushed for seventy eight yards in the game, three yards a carry. And you take away that long uh, reception from McLaurin, and he was kind of held to nothing outside of that 37 yarder. So, like, I, 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 I love the game plan that Leslie Frazier had, and they executed it great. And Matt Milano, like, I know you and me were talking about it all off season. Oh, you know, you know, outside linebackers or the running backs or the defense, you could pay them. You know, you could find those guys anywhere. But I'm, I'll happily eat those words because Matt Milano has been everywhere on this defense, and I, and. Honestly, he maybe outside of Tredavious White, maybe at this point they're about equal. But I mean, I think an argument could be made that he's the most impactful and best player on this defense at this point because the guy is just a menace, an absolute menace for offenses to have to deal with. Yeah, and and you know what? A couple, one other player that that stood out to me a couple times. He didn't put up a ton of numbers. I think he only had four tackles. Greg Rousseau. Mm-hmm. There's a Another couple game. of play. There's a there's a play. There's a couple of plays where it happened. The one that sticks out to me, I think it was the second or third quarter. Remember where? And they were trying to. Washington was trying to get a a, a run to the outside, to the right side, and Greg Rousseau just holds off, manhandles Cosme the entire way keeps forcing the running back outside, keeps forcing the running back outside until Edmonds and Milano comes and cleans it up for a loss. And you saw that a couple times where he's not making the plays, but he's just such a menace. And, you know, we're not, I think the one thing that's really gone under the radar, Sean McDermott teams never play the run that well. Even that 2019 team, their strength wasn't run defense. Like there were games even where they were holding teams to not a lot of yards. They were giving up some run, some some gashes. And this run defense hasn't done any of that. This run defense has been impeccable so far. I mean, this is you talk about all the good things about some of the Bills defenses over the years, and, and this is it pass rush, run stopping, secondary, you know, it and once again, they're going up against some bad quarterbacks coming in. So, you know, it it's just super super impressive so you know i don't know there's really much more to say about this game than maybe putting some giving out some awards and and moving on to uh on the houston absolutely absolutely so we have two sort of segments we're doing and we might need your guys's help for 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 naming these possibly so if you have any good ideas let us know so but i think for these first two uh we have some some names we're okay with here, but uh, so first one, Ryan. What what was your turning point in the game? Like, when, when do you think you realized that this game was sort of like put away, done? So, I don't know if this one I knew was done, done, but the the drive that'll stick out to me is getting the ball back with thirty seconds in the half and going down to kick a field goal. And I think that whole sequence of them. Right, they had that really, really weird sequence where they gave up 14 quick points and to score, stop, and then get the ball back with 30 seconds. And what they gonna have three timeouts there too, which is phenomenal coaching, and go down the field, get in field goal range, and go up 13 to close the half. 
you know, that's demoralizing if you're you're Washington, right? You just got it within a touchdown with about seven minutes ago in the half. And then you're, you're back down. You know, you give six of those points right back and one right right before the half that you could have prevented. And I think a lot of teams look at the Sunday, or was it the Monday night game last night? Sorry, yeah. Monday night game. Look what Mike McCarthy did last night and then come back to fight him because you're playing the Philly. But Mike McCarthy let the clock run out at the end of the half when he could have done the same thing. Nope. Like just the play calling there, aggressive, the execution there, excellent. And I just, to go up at the, go into the half up 13 versus up 10, I I think was just a massive statement and for, you know, for Washington to demoralize them and Buffalo to go in and be like, yeah, F you, we're not, we're not taking our foots off the gas. I, I, yeah, I, that's a hard one to, to not pick. So I'm going to, um, and I might be putting way too much stock into this one play, but for me, this was like my sigh of relief of, okay, like, here we go. And for me, it was that third and 15 conversion from Allen to Davis. And it was just because like, we've been waiting, I think for the first two weeks for like that kind of throw from Josh, just that like decisive, like, cause this was the best third down offense in the, in the NFL year ago. And they weren't, they were okay on third down throughout the two weeks. And to see that throw, to see that play from them, for me, kind of let me know, okay, like he's back because that was a strike. And that was like, it was a good route by Davis, a great throw. And it, it again, it was just kind of like that classic Allen, just backbreaking play for, for the defense that we hadn't seen really yet. So I might be putting too much stock into a play, but like for me, like that, that play was when I, started thinking, okay, this could be a great day for Josh. No, I mean, it's funny you say that because I saw what I say at the top of the show. You always know in the first couple of throws what kind of day it's going to be with Josh. And he hit that, and I think everyone kind of exhaled. Like, I, I think, and I, it's easier to say it in retrospect now, but I think you know, hit that throw and you're like, okay, this is this is a good Josh day. We're getting a good Josh day today. So, yeah, I, I think you're not the only one that I definitely ex- exhaled a little bit when I saw that throw. All right, so for our next segment here real quick, our two more segments left. So we have, uh, you know, for those who don't know, Ryan is a is a teacher, and we were thinking, you know, what 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 do teachers usually do? I mean, this might be more for uh, for the elementary level, if you will. But um, what do teachers usually do, right? When you're when you're well behaved in class, and when we were kids, you know, it was usually, you know, you get a gold star put next to your name on the wall, and you get all excited. So we were thinking, hey, who's getting who gets a gold star from us in this game? And it could be players, it could be coaches, anybody. Who you're giving your gold star, Ryan, for this week? The inaugural gold uh, star. I, 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 I was gonna, I was gonna go originally with the knees, but I'm gonna go veteran. I'm gonna go uh, Manuel Sanders. I just huh. think we saw everything that we hoped he would be. That grizzled vet who doesn't look like he's lost a step. Puts two touchdowns in in front of the Buffalo crowd, and if. If you look at him and I said, hey, this is 35-year-old Emmanuel Sanders, you wouldn't believe it. He's still doing everything well. And I just think in invaluable presence in that, like they said it, you know, one of the things that I, I never realized or really thought about going into the season was he's the only guy in this team with a Super Bowl ring. They said that on the broadcast. He got one with Denver. And I just think that's valuable. He showed it. I, I think he brings – uh, you know, we talked about you know the draft process, guys who kind of bring fu swagger energy, and I, I think he just another dude who brings that kind of swagger and energy to this team. And I thought it was just really fun to watch him out there today and the chemistry that he already has with Josh. That's great choice, great choice. I, I had him as a guy I was going to get my golden star to possibly, but I'm going to give mine to um to Leslie Frazier. And this might be even just like throughout the season, but I I, I really like what Leslie Frazier has done with the defense through three weeks and especially in this game, I just think that he, he, you know, talking about swagger, I've kind of feel like this defense has got their swagger back a little bit last year. They, they felt at times kind of lifeless, you know, kind of just going through the motions and in 2019, you know, they had some a little bit of swagger, you know, Shaq Lawson, Jordan Phillips would talk a lot of smack, you know, see Trey white, you know, making fun of Dak Prescott on the sidelines, that Thanksgiving game. And it kind of feels like they have that like sort of, you know, sense of, of, of confidence back. And I think a lot of that comes to Leslie Frazier, who's just putting these guys in positions to succeed. And and I think he's really doing a good job with that D-line rotation. I like that the, he put Rousseau, he, he and McDermott have Rousseau as a starter right out of way because I, I think that he has more than earned that role already. So I'm giving my gold star to Leslie Frazier. And real quick, Ryan, before we 
get into this Texans preview. Who's your LVP for Buffalo? Who's someone who you, which this is gonna be a hard one to pick, but who, who do you think um, is someone that, you know, you were disappointed with at, in this game? I'm eating my medicine. I mean, it's gotta be Cody Ford. He just, he, he did not have a good day on that line. Um, just, just got beat left and right by Deron Payne. Luckily, Josh was able to, to use his ability to keep himself clean and make throws downfield and somehow didn't take a sack all day. But Cody Ford's got to be better than he is yesterday when we go up against the Chris Joneses of the world. So for me, my LVP, actually, I'm, I'm kind of surprised you didn't pick this one, Ryan. I think you'll like this one. It's uh, Isaiah McKenzie. That's that's the guy I'm picking. And it's not just for that kick return, that that weird kickoff that like hung in the air because, you know, part of me says he's got to go get that. And part of me is also, you know, the wind was crazy. And that thing took a bizarre sort of just died in midair. But he does need, as a returner, he's got to get underneath that thing. But not just that. In a kick return where I think he ran into like Saran Neal for some reason. Um, and I noticed in the game, I don't know if anyone else saw this, but for punt returns, I mean, McKenzie was when fielding them, but did anyone notice that Mike Hyde was also kind of hovering around him? Like, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't even notice that. Yeah, Micah Hyde was out there. He was kind of deep, not as deep as McKenzie, but he was kind of like an insurance policy for just in case there was another punt or kick like that. And I just started noticing that a little bit. And although I do think that McDermott has faith in Isaiah, um, you know, it was not his best day as a returner. Uh, but again, but, but like there wasn't really much to pick for this award. So it doesn't mean I don't have faith in McKenzie moving forward. But I, I did think, I, you know, he was not uh, he wasn't great. Um, Mark Marquez Stevenson is eligible for return. This hey, week, well, we'll, we'll see. We, we, <laughs> we'll see if he comes back. I mean, who knows, man? Who knows? But <laughs> but hey, let's let's get into that, though, because now we're week four. Houston's coming to town. Um, no Tyrod Taylor, which I'm a little disappointed about because I actually would have loved to see Tyrod return to Buffalo um, because I do think he would have received a very warm ovation from Bills Mafia as he should because he's, he was nothing but a professional here uh, while, while he was here during the clown show that was Rex Ryan. Uh, but it's not going to be him. It's going to be Davis Mills, the rookie, who's just coming off his first start. So I think like looking at this Texans game, starting with their offense, like what, what to expect. And, you know, I was kind of looking through their numbers and I, you know, I was watching the highlights from their game against Carolina and, you know, my, my takeaways from their offense is that there's, there's they don't have much for starters. They really, I, I, I think outside of Brandon cooks there, they are just lacking with playmaking ability pretty much on all levels of their offense everywhere. And I, I just think that I, I just don't see much like explosiveness from them whatsoever. Yeah. If their running back room existed like eight years ago, like if I told you like six, seven, eight years ago, you could have a running back room with David Johnson and Mark Ingram, you'd be like, oh, holy shit, that's really good. But now they're both 98 in running back year, so it's a lot less scary. Uh, Lindsey Jones of The Athletic had a, had on one of her pre, uh, a show with Robert Mays was talking about, you know, the, there's guys you recognize on this team and, and there's a fun game. If you haven't watched a lot of Texans games yet, there's a drinking game you can play with this game, of course, if you're of age, uh, that every time you, you're you watching the game, you go, huh, that guy's a Texan now? Take a drink. Because there's a lot of those guys. Justin Britt, a guy that you probably remember from Seattle. Brandon Cooks, a guy who's been around on a couple teams now. Laramie Tunsil. And, you know, like you said, it, it, they have guys. They have guys who've been in the NFL before. Laramie Tunsil is a legitimate all all pro caliber left tackle and probably objectively the best player on this team, but you got to start with quarterback and, you know, in case you don't know what Davis Mills is or who he is besides uh, a third round quarterback, like John Edwards from Stanford, you know, I, I have his S his SIS page up here just cause that's the draft book I have. And they had him as the seventh best quarterback coming out of the draft between Kyle Trask and Kellen Mond. And, you know, they have him listed as a guy with, Good short accuracy, tough underneath, but decision makings are an issue. Uh, staring down receivers is an issue, and, and pocket awareness is an issue. You know, we just saw Tyler Henneke, a guy in his third start, really struggle against this defense. And you now you bring a guy who's a second year guy who only played eleven games, started eleven games in college, and played in fourteen, has to come in and play against this defense. In Buffalo, that is a really, really hard task. And, you know, 
you, you could say in that Carolina game, once they opened up and let him throw it a little bit, they found a little bit more success. But I, it's hard to find any sort of way outside of just, you know, you know, any given Sunday, right? But it, it's hard. The roads, the paths to him succeeding in this game is, is just incredibly minimal. I, I just don't see how a, a third round rookie in a second start in this it, it, on the dumpster fire that is the Houston Texans can come in and find any sort of measurable success. And I think another thing that stuck out to me about Davis Webb when I was like watching him last week is you mentioned his pocket awareness. He also just doesn't appear to be that mobile, which I think is you know good for the Bills defense because that means pin your ears back and just go after this guy. Because unlike Heineke, I don't see Davis Mills really extending plays so much and making throws off platform. You know, he's more of a traditional drop back, you know, pocket passer. Which I mean leads, to, which I think is going to lead to more blitzes because, like I mentioned earlier, you know Brandon Cooks is a good receiver. Like I, I still think the guy can play, and the fact that he's been one of the the best receivers in the NFL on this team is is remarkable. But again, I mean, you look at just from last week against Carolina, right? Like Brandon Cooks got, has nine catches, goes over 100 yards. The next guy for them is uh, I think Atkins or Akins, whatever his name is. He has 32 yards. Like that, they don't, you know, they don't get much out of anyone other than Cooks. So you have to think that you know Trey White on Brandon Cooks is a is a pretty good advantage for Trey White, and after that, just blitz and go after Davis Mills and 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 put this rookie, you know, to bed because at the end of the day, I mean, young quarterbacks against McDermott do not have a good record. I mean, Sean McDermott, similar to how we talk about Bill Belichick, he kind of owns rookies and and second year guys. So, I mean. I, I just think looking at this, this to me feels like a very just kind of lopsided matchup because again, you've talked about how, you know, the bills they're all the years in the McDermott, the run defense has been a little spotty at times, but the Texas running game has been horrible, horrible through three weeks. So, uh, you know, to me, this just, I, I can't look at this matchup and see anywhere where maybe the Texans have the bills number in any facet of, of what their offense versus our defense. Yeah, it, it, it it's a, it's not good. And the, you know, the, the couple at, their coaching's not good. There was uh, I don't know if you saw the series against Cleveland where they get to fourth and two, but get a flag. So they have the option to either they have the option to take fourth and two or go to third and 10. And he took fourth and two and punted. It's not a good coaching staff over there. They have, you got David Culley who by all, you know, I, I thought it was funny in the pregame, everything about, they were talking about all these things coaches had to say about him. It's always oh, a nice guy, always oh, loyal. Nothing was about how good he is as a coach or how smart he is as a coach, which I'm sure he knows more about football than I'll ever forget, or has forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. But at this level, just man, it it, it doesn't seem like a good situation over there. You know, the one, you know, the, the other X factor that is maybe Philip Lindsay. He, He's had really good years. It broke my heart that he went to Houston because I think he's a, a running back one for a team. But he just, at least, you know, he hasn't been doing anything for my fantasy team. He hasn't. He had a touchdown against uh, against Houston, against Cleveland. You know, maybe they try. They they see what what uh, Washington put on tape in that screen, and they try to get a screen out to him to try to get some chunk yards, but. It, it'll be a really hard time for them to to get anything going. And even that offensive line outside of Larry Tunsil just isn't good. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, yeah, they're, I mean, there's not much else to really say. I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah. it's not a good old line outside of Tunsil. Mills is a rookie who I think looked fine in his first game, but like, I, I, I don't think anyone should be too scared of him. The running backs they have are ancient. And you want to talk about another running back they have that makes you go, wait, they have him on the roster. And this, I didn't even know until I was watching that game Thursday night. Didn't it? I, when, when, since when did the Houston Texans sign Rex Burkhead? Like when was he a Texan? Like, like literally, like they literally have a team filled of guys that you, I haven't heard of in probably three years. So yeah, their, their offenses, it's kind of a mess. And honestly, their defense, which, not a lot of people talk about, but their defense really is also pretty awful. Um, I did not realize, Ryan, their defense is uh, is allowing opponents uh, on average just about 400 yards per game. I mean, that has to be among. I mean, I, I didn't look at it, but that has to be among one of the worst marks so far in the NFL. And 
just like they're just like the offense. Like I said, I mean, the defense, I mean, they have a couple guys that aren't bad. You know, Zach Cunningham's a nice linebacker. They still have Whitney Merciless, who's who's always been a good pass rusher. But again, a side of the ball where just there's just not a lot of like talent and nothing that really like pops and makes you scared, I think, as a Bills fan heading into this game. I would describe their front seven as <clears throat> excuse me, their front seven as passable. Like you said, Cunningham is an NFL quality linebacker. Winty Winty Mer- Merciless is an NFL caliber pass rusher. Christian Kirksey is an NFL caliber linebacker up there. And you get past those three and y- you have a little bit of a, of a nice unit compare, uh, you know, when you compare it to the rest of the team, but that secondary is not great. Their cornerback one, Vernon Hardgraves, who was cut from Tampa Bay before the end of his rookie contract. It there's not there's just it's a very thin sec. They had Justin Reed there. He's hurt. So there's just you and the guy coaching that team is Lovey Smith, who people figured out Tampa two 10 years ago and they brought it back. Go back and watch that Carolina game and look at how many passes dudes are just running wide open for Sam Darnold play after play after play. And you talk about a play designer like Brian Dable is going to eat that up. And once again, we talk about the offense. It's hard to imagine a world where they're able to stop Buffalo on a consistent basis. If Buffalo is not shooting themselves in the foot, if Buffalo is not putting the, the, the ball on the ground, if Buffalo's not throwing interceptions, they just they don't man up, and they just don't have the pieces. They just don't have the pieces to stop this offense. Yeah, I mean, literally, as long as they execute reasonably well, you got to think that Buffalo is going to put up yards and points in this game. And not to mention, too, like we've been talking about this Bills offense. This is the by far the weakest defense. They're, they have faced so far this season. And we're, and this is still a team that's put up, what is it, 76 points the last two games. So I I don't want to get to it. I know the spread is crazy. I mean, the Bills are favored by just a, a kind of a crazy amount heading into this one. Um, but this does just feel like a game where uh, when you look at the Bills offense versus the Texans defense, I mean, you mentioned the cornerbacks. I mean, that's the strength of this Buffalo roster is the receivers. And I, I just have a hard time believing – that Vernon Hargraves is really going to be able to hang with Stefan Diggs and that Lonnie Johnson is going to be able to hang with, you know, Emmanuel Sanders and Cole Beasley. So like you mentioned, the secondary is kind of a train wreck and it's not like they have a great front, you know, front seven to really take any pressure off of them. It's a decent front seven with a couple decent players. But again, this defense has just been a kind of a mess too this year and, and they're struggling just like these offense. So I, it, it it definitely feels like going into it. This is definitely uh, not going to be a fair fight. And you want to talk about more guys that that people you've heard of and go, huh? You know, Desmond King. He was a guy a lot of people mm-hmm. uh, kind of targeted at the trade deadline for Buffalo, but he's listed as their backup cornerback right now. So it it's just it, it's hard to find any places they really match up super well. They do have one of my favorite draft crushes as backup linebacker, Garrett Wallow from from TCU. But that, I mean, that's all, you know, Neville Hewitt's a guy you've heard of who's a, who's an NFL caliber linebacker, but it, that's it. You know, maybe Andre, you know, you might, if you want to find a place where they have an advantage and it's not really a matchup, but you know, Andre Roberts, he's had a rough start, but you know, this is a team that's had some special The bills have had some special teams issues early on this year. And I know Andre Roberts is off to a really, really slow start, but he's still a really smart punt returner, kick returner. And yeah, he doesn't have the burst to the break one, but you know, when, when you talk about how the teams get upset, it's about, it's losing things like field position battle. And so if you want to try to piece together a story, will it, where the bills get upset, it probably starts with an Andre Roberts, kick return and you know just just some really bad luck for buffalo absolutely absolutely agree so 
you know, we've kind of been just dogging in Houston here for the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes here. But is there any player on Houston who you look at and go, you know, okay, like that's a, that's a guy I'm keeping my eye on, you know, whether you think he could impact the game or if you just think that he's their, you know, their biggest threat, like who's a guy for Houston that you, you're just curious to see and you're watching for on Sunday. I said it when we started talking about the offense. Larry Tunsil is a legitimate, very, very, very good left tackle. And I'm curious if they give Gregory Rousseau pass or snaps against him. I want to see, A, if he gets it and, and how he does get it. Because that is that is probably, you could argue, you know, you, you could go back and forth with whether him or, or Brandon Scherfer better. But probably the best offensive lineman the Bills will go against, have gone against so far. Not offensive line, just in, individual offensive linemen they've gone against so far this season. So I, I would, I really want to see Greggy Rousseau go up against a top tier left tackle and just see how he does. See if he, see if he can find a way to win a couple reps and see if he can find a way to generate some pressure off that. Cause I think that's something that could really boost your confidence is just really good. You know, you, you talk about wanting to get better to wanting to improve, you know, there's no better, 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 better way to improve and practice than going up against a guy like Laramie Tunsil. So I hope to see some Laramie Tunsil, Greggy Russo reps or uh, matchups during the game. For me, I mean, I I, I don't know how well he's going to play, um, but I I am just kind of genuinely curious to see you know how Davis Mills plays because I think I think David Coley said like on Monday that we want to open up the offense for for Davis, whatever that means. Um, so I but I'm curious just to see like how how how. Does he handle this Bills defense? Because they made Taylor Heineke look pretty awful. They made Jacoby Brissett not look too good. And like Jacoby Brissett, I mean, I know he's not the best quarterback, but he's he's got thirty plus starts in his career. He's been around a little bit. He's seen a he's little a, bit. He's an NFL cal- caliber starter. Or NFL Absolutely. caliber quarterback. He's he's an NFL quarterback. You know, Big Ben struggled against Buffalo. So like I, I'm just genuinely curious to see, like, hey, can Davis Mills put up a fight against this defense. Can he actually make some plays? You know, because he had a couple of moments against Carolina that didn't look bad. He had that good drive, I think it was, at the end of the half, or you know, threw a good touchdown pass to another guy that you kind of forget on the Bears, Anthony Miller, who I I, I didn't realize he wasn't even in Chicago anymore. Um, so I, I'm curious to see how that matchup uh, kind of goes with Davis Mills. Um, and speaking of matchup, you know, Ryan, what is, you know, for key matchups of this game, like what, like what do you think this comes down to? at the end of the day. Cause for me, I'm, I'm looking at the trenches. I think, I, I think I want to see, you know, the best guy they have in their secondary is Vernon Hargraves. So I want to see, but I want to see Diggs have a game. I, I think this is a chance. Not that Diggs has been bad. Diggs is on pace for a thousand yards. So I want to see Diggs have a big game. I want to see Diggs. I think the key matchup is get Diggs back on track versus Vernon Hargraves get him the ball early and often and just let him, and I'm not just saying this because I have a multiple fantasy team, but let's let things go off. Let him, let him get back on track and let him flex. Like, I, I think that's what I want to see. I, I think this game is just about for me. If Buffalo does what they should do, like I say this tongue in cheek, but Buffalo should have 400 yards of passing and it should start with Stefan Diggs on, uh, on Sunday. And it starts with him versus, versus Vernon Hardgraves. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't pick a individual player matchup, but I I picked Texans O line against Bills D line, and I know they have Tunsil. We've talked about him, but we've mentioned the rest of that offensive line. It's pretty pretty damn weak. It's not good. And again, I want I want to see this Buffalo D line just because Washington did have the best offensive line they played through so far this season, and uh, the game plan wasn't to necessarily be super aggressive up front, but they did only get one sack on Taylor Heineke, which was like. One of my only strifes on this defense really was just, you know, didn't get a ton of pressure on him. I want to see this old, this D-line dominate against a really weak offense, similar to what we saw against Miami, right? Where that offensive line isn't good, and Buffalo made it look even worse. So I, I want to see lots of pressure on Mills because I think that's the way how you unravel a very young and inexperienced quarterback is just send pressure at them and basically say, hey, beat us. You know, making your your hots and your quick you know reads or whatever, because chances are they probably won't. So for me, I think that's the the matchup that I'm going to look for uh, going into this game. Do so, ha- oh, do you, oh, I was, was gonna that- say, do you, do you have a score prediction? 
Well, I was just going to say, yeah, so sore prediction. So, okay, I, I can assume we both have Buffalo winning this game. I'm just going to go on a, on a kind yeah. of a wing, on a wink here. Yeah. So right now, Ryan, I think this is more the question, and I'll, I'll ask you what your score Do they cover? Real quick. Exactly, because this is one of the biggest covers the Bills have ever had. 16 and a half right now is what it's at, and it was it opened up, I believe, at 17 and a half, so it went down a point, opened up even higher. I believe they've only been bigger favorites in three games in Bill's history. This is the third or fourth highest uh, spread they've ever had in this one. So 16 and a half, Ryan, do they cover? I'll give you my answer right now. Yes, they do. I'm winning 38 to 10. I just think that to me, like this Bill's team feels confident. It feels like they really believe in themselves that they are as good as everyone's saying. And not to mention, like people are talking about now with the way that the Chiefs have looked, which they've looked not great so far with the way the AFC has looked, the AFC East, which has been kind of a train wreck, frankly, through three weeks, like Buffalo being the one seed doesn't seem so impossible anymore. How, how we've seen sort of things play out here. I mean, right now, Denver Broncos have the best record in the AFC. You know, you're telling me that, you know, we can't beat the Broncos. So I have the winning 30 to 10. I think they're going to go in there, take care of business. This game won't really be close at any point. And uh, yeah, so that's what i got what about you do, do they cover what's your score I, I i hate picking picking blowouts and this was a really bad week for me with my money picking blowouts i had minnesota golden gophers minus 31 and they lost the bowling green but I, i'm gonna i'm gonna keep trying i think buffalo covers easily uh i i have them winning 40 to 17 same thing it, it it's just even i try to be analytical about it i try to be even cute and i try to not be you know yeah be objective guy about it try to be objective there we go that's what i was looking for objective and you know we i we were we were both kind of concerned about that sealers game so there's our you know we, we've been concerned about billy but it, it, it's just i don't see how the tech you know starting with the defense i don't see how the texas defense generates any stops and i don't see how the Texans offense is able to sustain any sort of success. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. So that about does it here for the five, a five report. We, you know, went through the Washington game, recap that give you kind of our thoughts here on this Houston Texan game uh, coming up on Sunday should be a good one. Uh, things are, are definitely starting to really heat up here in the NFL. I will say as a side note, kind of, kind of bummed out to see that for that bills. I mean, not like I was probably going to watch it for the bills game, but, it is a little bit of a bummer that Manning Cast won't be going for that Bills Titans uh, Monday night game in a few weeks. I've been watching that. I've been loving that. I don't know about you, but that has made Monday night football so much more entertaining. I think just to tune into them and see what they're going on. But I'm a, I'm a little bummed that they're not they're not going to be on now for a few see, weeks I'm, here. I'm, I normally like when people do funky things with the booth, and I think it's been I think it's really cool what they've done. I think I rather listen to the Mannings as a podcast because I like it's a, I don't know if it's because they. It's like, you know, you can't, they don't have the game volume at, at, at its peak level. And they, they, I mean, it was great. I saw Manning flip the double birds, but I think ESPN has also finally gotten their Monday night booth right. And I really like Steve Levy and, and Lewis Riddick. So I think that that's part of it. But also for this week, I will be at the game. I'm going home. I'm going to the game. So if you find yourself in the mud lot at any point on Sunday, I'll be in a uh, a Trey White Trey, Trey White jersey. Depending, I, I'm getting there at like 7 a.m. So depending what time you come, you, you see me. I might be uh, not the same Ryan you you're hearing right now. But if you're in the mud lot and you see a guy with a mustache and uh, in a Trey White jersey, come say hi. Absolutely, yeah. Go go see Ryan, guys. Go see Ryan for sure. I, I'm talk some ball. You know, enjoy a few enjoy a few beers if you're of age. Obviously. Um, yeah, so that about does it here for the uh, the 5v5 report. Uh, we really appreciate you guys listening. Uh, and thank you for for interacting with us on social media and, and tuning into all of our content. And, and keep on tuning into all the BF work. Uh, the season's getting really you know into the thick of things. I know we're expanding on a couple in a couple platforms. I don't, I'm not going to reveal anything, but there are some things in the works. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And uh, yeah, for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you guys for listening and have a great rest of your day.